this and my knowledge with other people. So thanks to Esa and to Chris for organizing this. So my trip is about Uganda. Um, just, why is it not changing? But there we go. So my name is Louis. I've been an overland guide or a tour guide for the past 10 years. I started with drifters, as you can see on my picture on the on the left, in 2011. So that's exactly almost 10 years ago. Um, I was born in Pretoria, a little city boy. Then I moved to George and lived on a farm. And as soon as I finished high school, started studying tourism, as that is what I always wanted to do. I've been an adventurous little boy since I was a young, young boy. And after university, I did my first. I then joined Drifters. Um, and at Drifters, I was one, a one-man show. So we used to take the truck with up to 18 people. And we used to take them up into East Africa, Uganda. We used to drive, cook, guide, keep them safe, and then also bring them back safely. As you can see in the picture here, this is at the equator in Uganda. This was one of the groups that I took there for a trip. I spent six months in Uganda for drifters. As you can see, the truck is quite a hardcore looking truck. It's four by four. It's got front diff, back diff. Um, get you out. And sometimes you also need a bit of a bigger machine to get you out. Um, so Uganda is a very beautiful country. We'll get to Uganda a bit later. So overland touring involves traveling over uh, certain countries or different countries. You'll start off in one country. Um, some of the trips we did, we used to go th through eight countries at most. Um, the pictures that you can see here is in Uganda. The one on the left of the screen is the source of the Nile. That is uh, the longest river in the world, as you can see. And that's where the official source of the Nile starts. The one on the right is Lake Pinyoni, and that's also in Uganda, and that's Uganda's deepest lake. It's up in an old crater, and swimming there, you can do swimming there. There's no crocs, no belezia. It's simply a beautiful country. So overlanding involves taking people on activities, get them through the border, make sure that all their passports and visas are in place, and then also make sure that the truck is safe and secure. If there's a breakdown, especially in Uganda, you have to fix it yourself. If there's a small town, you might get someone to fix it, but most of it you do yourself. So as you can see the picture on the left, keeping the, the client safe, this was in Botswana on one of my trips. We were on our way to go collect water for the camp. And this little, or we call him little bull elephant, his name was Franklin, because he was always in chasing us around, pitch breaking the tents. You can see he's quite agitated there. His ears are open and he's coming for us. These are all local guides that work with me. And then the one on the right, making coffee in the morning. That's the most important time in the day. When you are on an overland tour, you need good coffee and that sets you through the, through the day. These two pictures are also from Uganda. The one on the left is the camping setup that we use most of the time, especially in Uganda, we do camping trips. So two, two people will stay in a tent. The one on the left is... And then the one on the right is Ziva Rhino Sanctuary. You can see the thick uh, palisade poles that protect us from the rhinos. So we have to camp inside, but the rhinos are quite tame. So they come and say hi to you uh, whenever you camp at Ziva Rhino Sanctuary. And then activity-wise on overlanding trips, we do a lot of walks or hikes, mostly short hikes as we don't have much time. The one on the left is in Brandburg, that's in Namibia. I'm just showing you a quick briefing of going over what we do before we get to the main thing. And then also explain to the people what is meant by the painting, keep them safe. The one on the right is boat, a boat that we use in Botswana in the Okavango Delta. So there's a lot of different uh, methods of travel that we use. 
then I, I worked for Drifters for six years. I started there at a very young age. I was 21 and I took people up through Africa. Most of them could was old enough. Um, then I started, I broke away from Drifters and I did my professional guiding qualification. And in 2016, one of my dreams came through when I bought my own overland truck and I started building my own overland truck. It's called Sidewinding Travels, named after the Sidewinder snake that you find in the desert and the dunes of Namibia. So this truck is my, my baby from now on. If I do trips, most of them is done in the truck from Sidewinding Travels. It's quite fully equipped. It's got all the catering equipment on, seats, fridges, freezers, safety boxes, and it's quite a mean machine. Do the camp setup. So each person or two people will share a tent. We've got comfortable beds. We get the kitchen, we pack the kitchen out. The clients all help cook. It's all participative tours. They help with the dishes. And it's just so nice to be out in the bush sharing the nature with the clients that we take on tour. So all the countries that I've explored, I've listed all the flags here. As I've said in the beginning, not everyone that wanders is lost. For those of you that don't know all the flags, the most beautiful one is South Africa. Then we've been to Namibia, Swaziland on, from third from the left, next to Swaziland is Lesotho. The blue one with the black stripes is Botswana. Then Zimbabwe, the one with the um, soapstone bird. The one with the AK-47 and the X is Mozambique. Then Malawi. The next one with the bird in the middle is what we're going to be talking tonight. It's Uganda. The shield is Kenya. And then finally, we've also visited Tanzania. Ten In my 11 years as a guide, must be Uganda. Such a beautiful flag. All the different colors of Uganda. Black is for the local people. Yellow is for the mineral wealth that they've got. Red is for the colonial years and the Idi Amin and all the wars that they were fighting. The white circle is for peace, keeping the country under peace. And then the bird that you see in the middle there is your gray crown crane, or in Afrikaans, Mayem. That is the national bird of Uganda. And you see them everywhere in Uganda. And that's the country I'm going to be talking to you tonight. I will allow questions at the end. So don't worry if you have any questions. At the end, we'll have time to answer them. So sit back and enjoy the ride through Uganda with me. And come on an adventure for the next few minutes. So Uganda is known as the Pearl of Africa. As you can see by the two pictures that I shown you here, the one on the right is Murchison. Uganda was called the Pearl of Africa by Winston Churchill when he visited Uganda. The reason why he called it the Pearl of Africa, it's because of its serene beauty, diversity, friendly locals, different cultures, different people, different animals, more than a thousand birds. It's really the Pearl of Africa. Once you go there, you can always, you can't wait to go back. The bug has bitten you. So Uganda is a landlocked country in East Africa. It's actually one of the smallest countries in Africa. 241 square kilometers. And it's got a population of about 44 million people. The people there are such friendly people. Everywhere where you go, they will help you. You can see the fruit market at the top left corner. They've got fresh fruits in all shapes and sizes. If you take a pineapple in South Africa size, pineapples in Uganda is about five or six times as big and three times or four times as sweet. Even mangoes is almost the size of a rugby ball in Uganda. The things are so big. The photo on the right that you see is matoke. Those are green bananas from India. And they, they pluck them off while they're still green. It's almost like a potato. You peel them and you cook them like a potato. It's delicious, especially in stews. For the hikers in the group, the mountain at the bottom on the left is the Renzori Mountains. Um, um, they are the longest mountain kilometers long. 
And the highest peak is Stanley Peak, 5,109 meters above sea level. But what makes them so special is they are on the equator. So at the bottom, it can be 35, 36 degrees Celsius. Um, they are actually, the glaciers are melting at the moment, but if you're lucky and the clouds lift, you get some beautiful shots of the Renzori Mountains. They're also known as Mountains of the Moon. They're on the border between Congo and Uganda. So before we get to Burundi Impenetrable Forest, just to give you a, back, uh, of a bit of history about Uganda, Uganda's got more than 1,000 bird species, only second to the first, which is uh, Rwanda or Virunga. They've got 1,200 birds. The world's, half the world's population of Western mountain gorillas or just your mountain gorillas. And there's also more than 170 different mammal species in Uganda. Uganda's got 10 national parks, but when the impenetrable forest is one of them, you can follow the orange line where it says Uganda. That is the outline of the whole country. Kampala is the capital. That means city of Impalas. Before used to be thousands and thousands of Impalas before they got shot out. Then you move to the southwest. There's a small little red highlighted area, and that is Buwendi Impenetrable Forest. Buwendi is a local word from the Batwa Pygmies, which is found in uh, living in the forests, and that means impenetrable. So basically, you can say impenetrable, impenetrable forest. I've been through that forest three times before doing gorilla trekking, and it, at some places, you have to really chop your way through the thick forest us. So Buwendi is an Afro-Montane forest. It rains a lot in the forest there. It's green throughout the year. It's so beautiful to go into the forest. It, the air is clean, the birds, the animals, the sounds. It gives you goosebumps when you think about it, and especially if I'm talking about Uganda. It goes from about 1,106 meters, the lowest point, to 2,607 meters, the highest point. And that's why the mountain gorilla thrives in this area, because of the mountains, the hills, the foliage, the green plants that they can feed on. The park is not too big. It's 331 square kilometers. And it was designated in 1994 as a protected area to protect the gorillas. It's also got exceptional diversity. Apart from the gorillas, it's got 10 different primate species. It's got more than 160 species of trees, more than 100 species of ferns, which has been identified, 350 bird species just in the park, and then it's got 450 mountain gorillas. So the world's population is just over 1,000. So Buwendi's got just under half. Many people say more than half, but remember, it's quite difficult to see exactly how many gorillas there are because of the thick, thick forest. Um, the total population they estimate between Rwanda, Congo, and Uganda, 1,004 different gorillas. When you walk in the, in the Burundi, there's ancient, and at the bottom, they've got these buttress root systems, which branches out, and that's to anchor the tree in the wet soil from the rain. Some of those buttress roots are so big, you can actually climb inside them. Me with my big body can hide. And that's what the Batwa Pygmies use as their um, hideouts when it starts raining. The exciting stuff, these are the mountain gorillas. You can see the distribution in Africa. The mountain gorilla is a great ape of Africa. There's currently five species of great ape in Africa. The one we're going to If you take the gorillas on the right, the one, um, one, two, three, the third block, or one up from the bottom, you can see the big bulky face. Those are the mountain gorillas. The one at the top, that's your um, Western lowland gorilla. They found in Congo. You can see the orange color. 
And then your one at the bottom is your cross river gorilla. That one is critically endangered. They are found in a small, small pocket between Congo and Cameroon. Bonobo, they are the ones from, you, you, from Congo. The chimpanzee covers the biggest area of all the um, great apes. So at the bottom, there's one that says Eastern Gorilla. It's a little map that's highlighted in pink and red. So you can see the lowland gorilla, how big their habitat is. And then between Uganda, Congo, Akigali, and Rwanda, that is where you find the mountain gorilla. And that's the ones that we're going to talk about. So both these pictures was taken on my first trip when we went to the mountain gorillas. As mentioned, they are one of the five great apes of Africa. They used to be critically endangered by the IUCN, but great news for us, their population is coming up. I've heard news that they are now at a stable population. So now they've been classified as endangered by the IUCN. And that's great because the gorillas are the most sought after attraction in Uganda. People, when they go to Uganda, they wanna go see the gorillas. Just an interesting fact, their name is Gurili Gurili, the scientific name. And the word gorilla comes from the Greek word gorillai, which means the gorilla's name comes from gorillai or the Greek word. So these guys live in tight knit families, mothers, infants, that's babies, uh, black backs, that is adults or males, that's not um, dominant yet, they subordinate, and then your silverback. Your silverback are the ones with the muscular skulls, the muscular muscles, and then also the silver hair that they grow at their, at their back, on their back. So the mountain gorillas, they, they live in tight little families, usually about four, but the 98.3% of their genetics are shared uh, human genetics. So they are highly intelligent. We've seen them use tools like the chimpanzees to get termites out. Um, funny enough, most people think they only eat leaves, foliage, celery, shoots. They do eat insects, bugs. And we've observed, observed one before where they've had a, a chameleon for lunch. So they do have a bit of a carnivore diet, but mostly they feed on leaves, twigs, and so on. Silverback is the protector of the family. He's also the biggest. They can weigh up to 180 kilograms, and that's pure, pure muscle. He's the protector of the group, so he will decide where the group feeds, where the group plays, where the group goes, and he's very fond over the babies. We've seen them when we went gorilla tracking and the babies come and play with your feet and your hair and your cameras, he will give a loud grunt and then the guys will tell you or the rangers will tell you, look down. Because if you look directly in his eye, it, you want to challenge him. So the silverbacks, they are the, fa the father of the group and they protect the babies and the mothers with all their life. So babies are born after eight and a half months, the gestation period. They weigh about 1.4 to 1.8 kilograms when they are born. And for the first, it's still a younger one. Um, they stay with the mother, constant contact. So that the mother knows they are there and they also can have the warmth of the mother. The one on the left is about eight months old. You can see he's already playful eating. Um, then they start going out for the next two and a half years. They stay with the mother, come and go. The mom teaches them everything before they move off. Um, they can give birth to twins. We've heard of twins being born before, but mostly they give birth to a single infant or a single baby. They are so cute when they are so young. Um, they stay with the mom for four years before they move off. The lifespan of a gorilla is about 40 to 45 years. So it's quite a long time. And the mom can have a baby every five to six years. The babies are so cute when you do gorilla tracking. They are so inquisitive. If they, a bit, bit older than a year, they start playing, they start interacting. 
They spend about 30% of their time feeding. They spend about 30% of their time traveling and playing with each other. And then 40% of the time is spending relaxing rest. Um, and they can't see at night. So at night, they will make themselves a nest. We usually say they start at about 6 a.m. When the first sunrise come up, they are out. So they are the roosters of the forest. So to show you on the next one, where gorillas sleep, the, there's two rangers and researchers. So every night, the gorillas will build themselves a nest, which is elevated from, a ground, from the ground, as you can see in the middle picture between the black backs and the female, they will lift themselves off the ground. In the middle, they will use dung. They'll defecate in their own nest. You can see there's one at the bottom left corner that is a bit lazy. So he will wait for the others to build a nest and then he will go and fight for that nest. So he is the clever one, but that does not always work. So the shoots bark. They will make a round nest. They'll build it up almost like a seat. And that's where they will spend the night. And that's to keep them warm and also keep them dry because the gorillas um, don't like the rain, actually. So they live in a rainforest. We've been tracking the second time in Burundi. They were playing, having fun. And as soon as the rain started, they just became miserable. Um, they leave the nest when they depart. And the next night, they will build Make their own little beds and their own nests. They do sleep quite close to each other. You can see they're usually in pairs. And then on the right corner, they're more than two. And that's to keep contact at night because they're very scared at night. They will constantly make noises and grunts at night. And they will also huddle together to keep each other warm because it does drop below freezing down in the valleys in the So people and gorillas, gorilla tracking. Um, people is the main lifeline or the main blood for the gorillas um, in terms of bringing money in. It also contributes a lot of uh, US dollars. It's charging US dollars to the community. You can see how big the gorilla on the left is. That is a silverback. You can see his massive head. And that's to uh, carry the strong jaws that they use to eat the twigs and the leaves. And their muscle jaw, jaw muscle is so heavy that they have to have these big um muscular skulls you can see the one on the right that was also a silverback if you look between the leaves at the bottom there's a bit of silver here and the, what the two people are doing there is they are showing submissive behavior to the gorilla so he most probably challenged them and then they were told to look down and turn around so as i've mentioned before the gorillas is the most sought after um taking photos and then also coming and bringing money into Uganda. Then tracking the gorillas, this is where the fun starts. That's such an amazing experience that you cannot um, describe to anyone. Picture on the second track, you have to have long pants and then good, good hiking shoes. And you have to stick your pants into your shoes because there's fire ants and those ants get into your shoes and they start biting you. If one starts biting, all of them starts biting. There's also a lot of stinging nettles, um, which goes into your shoes and they burn quite a lot. So in Uganda itself, there's 44 habituated groups of gorillas in five different locations. They're all in Burundi. Ruhija is my favorite. That's the highest point. Then you get to Shaga which is more lower down. You get Bahoma, which is the main tracking center. You get Nkuringo, which is more towards the Virunga side. And then you get Rubugiri, which is far down into the mountain in a valley. There's 152 permits that get, gets issued every day on a daily basis. That was before COVID. And only eight go and search for these gorillas. The reason for that is because gorillas share our genetics, as mentioned, 98.3%. They're very susceptible to diseases that we carry. A gorilla permit these days, the price is 700 US dollars per person. And you have to book it through Uganda Wildlife Authority. So there's two ranges that go with you every day. 
they go the night before and they locate the nests and they also set the GP. You will meet your guide and your rangers armed with machetes because they make your way through and you will start your descent or your ascent, depends where the guerrilla groups are. We fight an hour before and we found them and an hour back. The guerrillas, we were on the trail, but they kept moving. It was six hours and then we had to hike three to four hours back. Once the group is located, your guide will give a grant telling them it's him. You will leave your bag and your water ach, and your food with the other guy. You're only allowed to take your water through and you spend one hour with these incredible animals. So you can see, I've, I've also placed the same picture there, but this was on our way, the big picture with the drifter's truck that was on our way into Bahoma. Um, we were still on our way to our camp where we were going to do gorilla trekking. And the excitement that you get once you start driving through these forests, the road is a one track road. So as soon as it starts raining, you start slipping and slip and slide. But the biggest challenge is if there's a vehicle coming from the front to get the massive truck past that vehicle. So sometimes you have to have a bit of a, a plan there to get through to your destination where you want to be. Then protection and research. The guys on the left are doing research. They're collecting dung samples from the, or feces samples from the gorillas. These get sent to a lab and then they can eat. Half of the animals determined through the feces. And then the guy on the right armed with the rifle is a true Uganda Wildlife Authority or UWA ranger. There's about 440 rangers in Bawindi National Park and they protect the gorillas for bushmeat. Their hands were sold as a commodity and they also used the skin. But these days the gorillas are protected thanks for the money that tourists bring in and their population is um, on the rise. Then the threats of the gorillas, obviously global warming is a problem. The forests are getting warmer and warmer and warmer. Um, illegal logging, as you can see the picture on the right, this is a, a, a lone picture. These guys will cut down the hardwood trees that's more than 100 years old. The picture on the left, you can see the clear, clear line where the forest tries to survive to the left, but farmers try to survive to the right. This is a hill of 2,000 meters high. And the farmers here, they plant Irish potatoes, green peppers, mangoes, tomatoes, carrots, anything you can think of. They plant on these slopes. They make a little gully and that stops the water from coming down. It's very, very fertile soil. Lately, the gorilla tracking has been minimized because they've done research and they found out that gorillas can get a mild strain of flu or COVID. So they are busy researching that to allow people to come back in. I'm not sure if you've heard of Diane Fossey, just to give you some information, 1967, she was, she's gone to Rwanda and she was determined to habituate wild gorillas. It took her more than 10,000 hours to habituate the group of gorillas and she showed the world. She was one, there was one favorite gorilla, she called him Digit. He was a youngster. He had no friends or family to play with. And he took Diane as his own. He sadly got killed. And in 1985, Diane Fossey got killed and her killers were never found. The next, if you follow down to the Southwest, you'll see Bowindi. And then just North, you'll see Lake Edward, Queen Elizabeth Park, and then on the right, Lake George. Queen Elizabeth Park is a beautiful park as the photos show. The antelope on the left is Uganda cop. That is the national antelope of Uganda. There's also Uganda cop on the right. Queen Elizabeth Park is one of the most diverse parks that I've seen in Africa. The mountains that you can see at the back are the Renzori Mountains, Mountains of the Moon, and behind that is Congo. The park has 1,978 square kilometers. 
established as Kazinga National Park in 1952 and gazetted as Queen Elizabeth National Park 1954, after there was a visit by Queen Elizabeth II herself. Um, it spans across the equator line. The equator goes right through the park, and the mountains at the back there in Zoris is 3 million years old. Queen Elizabeth National Park has got more than 600 different bird species, but most of the animals in the park were almost slaughtered to extinction during the were slashed for their ivory and also for their bush meat, but due to efforts and due to tourists coming to the park, the elephants have are now more than six thousand elephants. That's more than a hundred, more than six hundred percent increase in the last twenty years, thirty years ago when it was still under colonial rule. Um, there's buffalo, leopard, and lion. So only the rhino is missing from the big five that you find there. What makes Queen Elizabeth National Park quite special? Picture on the left was taken at the Ishasha. Behind it is Congo. The giraffes there have got three horns, special giraffes from Uganda. But what makes my visit special or made my visit special was the tree climbing lions. They are only found in the Ishasha region close to Congo. And it's not small trees that they climb. The trees are about eight, 10 meters high. Fig trees, euphoria trees, sausage trees. Sometimes there's so many lions in a tree, it looks like a Christmas tree because the lions look like uh, the Christmas decorations. The reason why they climb these trees, it's a unique behavior. Back in the, in the 1950s, there was a big outbreak of Nangana disease or sleeping sickness caused by the tete fly but the tete flies only at ground level. So the lions got clever and they started descending to the trees to escape the biting and itching tete flies. They soon realized the foliage gives them cover because it's found the park is hot there in summer. And thirdly, they can scan the plains to look for their special prey. They mainly feed on buffalo and Uganda cob. That is their special um, diets that they, they find in the park. After the gorillas, the tree climbing lions are second sought after in Uganda. You can see even the cubs start climbing the trees at a young age. The lioness on the right has got a tracking collar. There's a lot of people doing research um, for the lions. They will still want to find out exactly why they climb the trees, but they've recently found out that the lion range so that the females can come into the male's home range. They've also found out that the lions do migrate to Congo and back, and also from the south to the north of the park following food. Um, you can see the picture on the left, how the lioness, lioness is really sleeping. There's another tail hanging down, and there's a food from another one there. And then the one on the right giving you that stareful look, um, but she's quite comfortable. So. This is the biggest carnivore of Uganda. Um, the leopard is there, but the leopard is not as big, and it's known as the king of beasts. Um, so the tree climbing lions, they found in other parks, Merchants and Falls National Park and the north of Queen Elizabeth, but only in the Ishasha section, they do um, climb the trees. So they, they give birth about to lion cubs every two years if the con lion cups after a gestation period of 100 days. The lions are also constantly moved by Uganda Wildlife Authority to other parks to try and get the genetics um, stable. They've also been reintroduced in parks in Uganda where they've never ever seen lions before. Just as a matter of fact, uh, in 2019, before the outbreak of COVID, a single lion in Queen Elizabeth National Park generated 15,000 US dollars a year from tourism that people wanted to come and see the tree climbing lions. So they bring a lot of money into the park and into Uganda. Going more north to, um, to of the park, the Kazinga Channel, that is a natural channel that connects Lake Edward and Lake George. It's 32 kilometers long. It's got more than 1,200 hippos estimated. Population. There's also numerous crocodiles. 
But the reason why the hippos love it so much is the average depth of the lake and the channel is 2.4 meters deep. And there's a lot of grazing for the hippos there. There's more than 300 bird species. Elephants love to come and swim in the river. Hippos are everywhere. That's also a lot of swamps. So it's also the breeding ground for the shoebill stalk, which I will show you a bit later. Um, it's also a lot of boat cruises come on there. So tourism bring a lot of money in. There's lodges on the channel and the bird life. Amazing. What's nice there, it's a national park, but the local people are allowed to harvest water from the river, harvest fish from the river. The locals from Kasesi come with their Boda Bodas. It's a mo motorbike. It's known as a Boda Boda because it takes the people from Tanzania, Tanzania border to Uganda border. It's 10 kilometers. And they started calling it Boda Boda. They come and get the fish. They take it to Kasesi and they sell it at the local fish market. There's also, as I've mentioned, more than 6,000 elephants in Queen Elizabeth National Park. Distantly related to the storks. Um, it breeds in Uganda and then in the north of Zambia. Um, and it breeds in Kazinga Channel in the swamps, um, where there's a lot of papyrus lined um, plants. They feed on lungfish. You can see it's called a shoe bull because of the shape of the bull. And once a lungfish goes in there, there's no escape. On the left is a beautiful picture of the gray crowned crane, the national bird of Uganda. The national soccer team is also known as the cranes. And that's because of the gray crowned crane. You can also see there's many kingfishers. All seven species of kingfisher is found at the Kazinga channel that you find in Uganda. It's home to great white pelicans. Marabu stalks are there everywhere because the people, when they cut the fish and they drop some droppings, they, marabus are there to come and clean um, up. There's also gulls, cormorants. It is a birder's paradise. You can spend days coming and seeing what is going on at the Kazinga Channel. Animal that's been with me on tour. Um, I've done the strips for 11 years. I've seen many, many animals. I've researched many animals. I've made contact with many animals. But my favorite animal that I admire because of the intelligence, because of the way that they look after the calves, the other matriarchs are leading them to water, must be the African elephant. Picture on the left, you can see how they are dust bathing, keeping themselves cool from the sun and also from biting insects. By the way, that's a female. If you take a look at the forehead, comes down straight at an angle. Um, males is more round like a soccer ball. So my, my best experience that I've had in the last 11 years must have been a season in Botswana, but I really wanted to share it with you. This happened with a group of mine where we went to the Chobe River and we parked at the perfect spot. Elephants never came, and Chobe has got the world's highest concentration of elephants. We had coffee, we had breakfast, the group was getting agitated. Where's the, uh, the elephants? You promised us elephants. It was dry season, so the river was quite low. And on the other side of the river was a hippo that was lying there dead, motionless. I spotted something with my binoculars as I was sitting on top of the roof. The roof was open. We were all sitting on the roof of the 4x4 vehicle having breakfast. I saw something move behind this hippo. She was actually giving birth. Hippos give birth in the water, um, but there was not enough water that day. It was a young mom. She had no choice. It was a difficult pregnancy. The baby was about halfway out. Lots of blood, lots of pain, and we heard the spine-chilling howl of a hyena. That hyena came straight past us and grabbed the baby elephant. Louise Hogarth, she contacted me and I said to her, I don't really have footage of what happened. And she said, let's make an animated film. So sit back, enjoy, and see what was my most memorable experience in the 11 years.
the Chobe River, hoping to see elephants cross. On the way, they saw zebras, giraffes, meerkats and elephants. Following the course of the magnificent river, they parked at the perfect spot and waited for the big herds to arrive. And then suddenly, they were interrupted by the spine-chilling howl of a hyena. The hyena sprinted past their vehicle. It was focused on something. In the mud was a fully grown hippo, motionless. She had just given birth. In a flash, the hyena descended on the helpless baby and snatched it with its great jaws. The guests cried, no! And then out of nowhere, they heard the angry trumpet of an elephant. They looked up and saw a large matriarch with a baby. She started running, unleashing a ferocious trumpet. High in the air, she charged straight at the hyena. The terrified hyena dropped the baby and in its panic to escape, drove through the hooked thorns of a woolly caper bush. The mother hippo rushed to her calf's side. Luckily, he was only missing an ear. After a brief reunion, the mother hippo and the elephant faced each other and stared deep into each other's eyes. What were they thinking? The mother elephant seemed to say, Hamba kakutle, or stay well. Lewis returned to the same spot many months later and saw a mother hippo and a youngster with no right ear. So that was one of the most amazing experiences that I've had in the 11 years. So that brings us to the end of my talk about Uganda and about my adventures. Once again, thank you so much to Essa and Chris for organizing this. I hope that you guys have enjoyed the talk and that I've ignited that little fire experience Uganda with me. Very often people are scared to travel into Central or East Africa. But those countries, in my opinion, are more safe for tourists than South Africa. And I would love to one day meet one of you or all of you in Uganda. Or perhaps we can both share together the experience of meeting a wild gorilla, staring them in the eye. And down onto us. So thank you so much for the opportunity. If there's any questions from your side, you are more than welcome to ask them. Louis, I think, um, look, thank you very much. We did get uh, we did get quite a few questions in on the chats. Um, I wonder okay. if I can ask you, Louis, to uh, just run through those questions and Louis, give you a chance to answer those. Okay, let me just go through them quickly. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, Mariam asks, uh, sorry. Aaron asks, why are the silverbacks that color on the back? Is it because they're older? Also wondering why the females only have babies every five years if the gestation is eight and a half months. The silverback, that is because of the testosterone in the animal's uh, body. They are more muscular, more dominant. It's the same with the male lion. If they are more dominant, they get a much bigger mane, sometimes a darker mane. And that silver color comes from age. And the mother can only have babies every five years as the baby stays with the mother for three years, sometimes four years, and they have to recuperate after that baby. So they've got a big mother and baby bond. It's very similar to human. I've seen before where they've actually held their little time to replenish their bodies. Okay, cool. Next question from, from Chris was, do the gorillas make new nests every night or do they stay in the same place? So, so that depends on the available foliage that they can eat. <laughs> Moving. But if there's sufficient foliage, they will stay in the area for maybe a day or two. But if they do move off, they will make a new nest every night. 
Okay. Sharon asks, are the lions as big as our lions or smaller to make climbing easier? That's obviously the tree climbing lions. So the tree, tree climbing lions are the same size as our lions. The males weighs about 120, 140 kilograms. Um, so they're the same size as ours. They're not smaller. The females is a little bit smaller, but the males are definitely the same size. They've got smaller manes, um, but the body size is much, much bigger. I've seen them. What they usually do is they take a bit of a run up and then go up the trunk. The trees grow in a trunk and then they will climb up to the foliage. But I've seen some desperate lines before where they've misjudged themselves and jump into a bush and then they realize the bush is too small and then they fall down. <laughs> but they're the same. Mm -hmm. um, were, were the pink streaks on the hippo just mud or were they partly albinos? Asks Nick Cowley. So that big, that big male hippo was taken at the Shasha River. That is a skin condition that the hippo has got. So it's a bacteria that feeds on the brown pigment from the, from the animal and then it reveals the pink skin underneath. So that wasn't from fighting. I actually researched it and they say it's a skin condition from the hippo. Mm. Okay. Uh, Maram just says, those look like very healthy, well-fed lions. And <laughs> Alan Smith says, uh, I believe you're also tree climbing lions in Tanzania. Is that correct? Did you, I don't know if you got no. that, uh, it, maybe it cut out. Um, just, just to repeat the question. Okay. Alan Smith asks, I believe there were also tree climbing lions in Tanzania. Is that correct? Yes, there is a small population in uh, Tanzania that's also doing the tree climbing exactly the one, like the ones in Ishasha. So in Uganda, Ishasha is the only pride that does it. And then in, in Tanzania, there is also a pride. Okay. And he taught it on to the females that's there. Okay, Mariam asks, when's your next trip to Uganda? As soon as the world opens up and things become better, I'll go tomorrow. Any day. <laughs> okay. And then Lisa says, so she says, I understand about the tourism and fun generation of the gorilla trips, but that photo of all the people pointing cameras at the gorilla makes me feel sad. Do the tours not have one photographer assigned to document the experience? No, uh, everyone, everyone, definitely that's the way that we are. We want to take photos of everything. But when I take my groups in, I tell them for the first 10 minutes, I will time you, take your photos, and I will tell you and put you smell, hear, listen, and experience the growth too, so that they can get the maximum um, pleasure out of their visit. Okay, Sharon asks, what are the costs? Can I keep a kidney? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so the, the current current the current permit price is 700 US dollars per person. That is way cheaper than um, Rwanda. Rwanda is 1,200 US dollars per person at the moment. Well, so you have to sell both kidneys, Sharon. Yeah, you have to you can't keep one. <laughs> 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 but but that, that 700 US dollar, it's worth to pay because sitting with those gorillas, seeing their fingers, that's like our human fingers, looking into their orange, deep, sunken eyes. Okay. It's a feeling you can't describe to anyone. Andrew, I'm, I'm cool at the moment. Dad's gone, so I'm saving about 10 grand a month. <laughs> that's one way to do it. <laughs> uh, uh, Lewis, thanks for that. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, you were the guy who made contact with, uh, with Louis, so I want to say thank you to you. And do you want to just say a couple of things? Yeah, hi hey guys. Thanks so much for coming online. And just to say, wow, Louis, you really rocked it tonight. You know, I was so privileged to have some time to listen to Louis while we were hiking on the Kruger Trails and to hear the stories firsthand. And what we heard tonight is only a fraction of what Louis has to share. Uh, but something I'm really excited about is the possibility of doing a birding trip using Louis' overland trip, uh, his overland truck. Um, so as soon as things calm down with COVID and we start going back to normal, probably beginning of sometime early next year, 
um, I'm going to start putting some notices out that we will look to get a group of guys together and do probably five, six, seven days um, around Buckerstrom and what have you. And Louis is a, is a birding genius. He really knows his stuff. And uh, I think it would be a glorious trip and lots of stories to tell. And so, yeah, watch this, watch this space. We're working on it. Oh, great. <laughs> So, so Louis, at this, at this point, then, all I can say is thank you very much for joining us at ESSA. Uh, I know it's difficult. I know this online thing is not how we all operate. But, uh, but thank you for persevering. And uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us at ESSA. We are hoping that as, uh, as uh, the numbers come down, we might be able to host a hybrid meeting again next month. But let's see what the announcements are. But Louis, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Your your passion for these areas and uh, and your photography and so on just absolutely sells it for us. So I don't I think don't be shy. Please advertise your business to us. Uh, drop us an email. We'll share it with the club. Um, I think we can only say thank you. And I would like to offer you a virtual bottle of wine. Except unfortunately, I drank it tonight. While I was listening to you, but uh, but next time we see you, we'll definitely uh, we'll definitely thank you for that uh, in person. So everyone, um, I would like to just ask you once again: please take your uh, turn your cameras on, uh, unmute yourselves, and let's give Louis a very warm round of applause. That, that, that was truly a fantastic talk, Louis. I wish you all the best and we look forward to your next uh, joining you on a trip or having you speak to us again. So thank you. Thank you so much. And keep me, keep me in the you. loop. If you want any speeches on other countries, um, especially if I can come and talk in person, then you can see my hand movements and everything. And I'll come <laughs> and do it again any day. No, we definitely want to hear another talk, so we'll wait to hear from you. <laughs> okay. I did. I did join. I did join your face group, Facebook group this afternoon, so. Oh, I'm great! Well there. done. That was so we could see it was you. <laughs> okay. Yes, thank you so much. All right. Good luck. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again. Bye. 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 Good evening to everyone. Bye. Bye. Might as well stop recording. Okay, just an uh, interesting are, thing for the guys on, are, online. We had an international uh, portfolio of guests tonight, including all the way from Switzerland. Yes, so, guys, Bulgaria. give us a wave. No, except, except <laughs> that, that they got their time zones wrong and they came in at the end of the meeting. Uh, yeah. No, Louis, for your, for your interest, we also had Bulgaria guests. We had someone, I think, from London. So, yeah, your reach is international now. Uh, All right, guys. Thank you. Have a great evening, eh? Thanks. Hey, thanks. Thanks, thank thanks for that, Chris. Thanks, thanks for Hi, everything. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, Chris, yeah, you must just remember, Chris, to switch off your recording. Yeah. Okay.